So thank you very much for the invitation, and uh, I'll start with this sort of extension of my biography. Usually when people invite me, I send them a word file with seven different biographies and they can choose because I, because I have such a hybrid background that I never know whom they invited. Did they invite the artist? Did they invite the art curator? Did they invite the architect, the historian, or anybody? And so the, these curriculas look very different in different fields. So if you uh, are able to read German, the first homepage is basically mainly in German, the second is German English, and the third is only German yet. And today I will speak about uh, the productivity of crime for urban design and urban perception, as it was promised, which is a project which I was following for quite a long time, quite a long time ago as well. And I start with this image, which is a photograph by Julius Schulman, one of the most favorite, uh, most well-known architectural photographers of late modern architecture in the United States, especially in Los Angeles. There's almost no superstar villa in the Hollywood Hills that is not photographed by him. And as you can see, he also photographed uh, bank buildings in the basement. And this is quite a beautiful example for the so-called productivity of crime, because crime produces protection against itself. And this is probably one of the most beautiful sculptures or architectural masterpieces, how how the treasures can be uh, hidden. But it's not only a, a physical tool, it's also a symbolic tool because it's much more beautiful than necessary uh, to show everybody that we have to close somebody something off. So there's some treasure inside. And uh, this has a long history and we'll come back to that later. But I wanted to start to, to, with a very short repetition how I got into the issue. Uh, when I got struck by the crime issue, I was still in the art field and I, within the, it's a completely different story, so it's quite interesting that I made a lot of curves in my research to end up where I am now, or where I've been some years before. I was wondering how much uh, opportunism one has to have in society to be accepted as an ordinary member. and within the art world, how much of transgression or of misbehavior or of deviant behavior you have to have to be accepted as some, somebody special. And this is something which is quite nat natural for all social encounter. If you behave super opportunistic, you become part of the group, but bec you become the boring member of the group. If you behave special, you might become no member of the group because they exclude you, or they kick you out afterwards. So this is a very subtle balance of behaving correctly and misbehaving in the very productive way to become the superstar of the gang, for example. And, in, and this was a sort of self-reflection of my own position in between art, architecture, history, etc. Whereas, where's my position and why I'm kicked out in all the fields? And how can I re-implement myself by nice behavior or make myself special by misbehavior? And the first event I organized to discuss this issue was that I invited several experts to a sort of Saturday night show in an art space where they all brought up cases of misbehavior, which even ended with real serious crime as a misbehavior to force the productive forces of society to improve themselves. And this was done in a format of a TV show. I was the moderator. There were a lot of cameras, TV studios, and people had to, had to get into a sort of stage set, which was a copy of the German Crime Chase magazine, Akenzeichen XY, I don't know if that's existing here. In English it's called The Ten Most Wanted, for example. When policemen appear on TV and show real cases, actors play the murder, and then they ask the population to help you to detect, detect crime. And this was a quite politically incorrect format, but people were uh, in, enthusiastic about it and enjoying this sort of presentation. Later invited a, a journalist and a lawyer to discuss to compare art production and real crime on occasion of the German uh, criminal called Dagobert, uh, who was uh, pretending to have poisoned supermarket chain food and asked for money. And whenever the, po the police had to give him the money, the policemen were very surprised because he built some special tools for the money. So he built a, a, a model of a boat 
and, and send it in the river spray to the meeting point, and the policeman had to give, you know, give the box of money on the boat, and then the boat disappeared in the spray, and then into the canal system, and end up nowhere. Or the, the other time, he asked the police to put the box of money in a small sort of train car he made himself in the in the underground system. And when they put the box in the train, then the train disappeared in a tunnel, which was ne not open for the last 30 years. And so, so he really behaved like a sort of performative artist in all these sort of situations. And, and later, when he was imprisoned, he had to be released very, very very early because the, even the people in the, in, in the jail said that he's not a normal, not a normal criminal, he doesn't fit to that system. Even in, even in jail he's too deviant in comparison to the others. He's, he, he's an artist and he should be sent back. Uh, and in fact he was an artist before, uh, worked as a photographer, got uh, unemployed and bankrupt and told his wife that he's going for a job every day, but he didn't dare to confess that he had no job anymore. So he just went in, into his dacha and was thinking about how to get money. And he was really he was really here in Berlin at that period of time, and people considered him to be the Robin Hood of the contemporary times. So as you can see, it is not so natural that a criminal is the evil one. He can also become the opposite. Um, but in that period, uh, period of time, I was only reflect, reflecting on the position of, of an artist and in comparison to a, to a criminal, of course, with this romantic approach of Robin Hood, etc. But later on, I remembered myself that I studied architecture before and that this is the only field where I'm really the expert. So then I could invite myself to my show as an expert because at that period of time, I could only moderate. And when I invited myself to the show, I, I, I changed it. And I, I had different guests and had a different system to gain knowledge. And one of the systems, or let's say the methodologies of gaining knowledge was that I started first to do a sort of lecture series like this one where I invited everybody with whom I, who, whose knowledge I wanted to get. Uh, it's a very practical thing, so you pay a very little amount of money, get the knowledge, discuss about it, teach yourself automatically, and, and sharpen your, your own arguments. And after this sort of lecture series, I made guided tours in the city of Vienna, two specific places that are significant for the productivity of crime, which we will see later. And I did it once with a philosopher which taught me in post-structural philosophy. I didn't understand that at the beginning. It came later after several years that it made sense for me. Then I did it with a feminist planner who was talking about yeah, the, the, the Angsträume, so the, the fierce places in public space. But I also did it with, with social democratic Viennese historians, which were very much in love with all the outlaws of the suburbs, the historic outlaws of the suburbs. And I also did it with the chief detective of the Viennese criminal police, which was my best informant. And first he was quite shy and didn't really dare to join my tours because these, these tours were public. So I hired a bus. In the bus was me, the microphone, and my guest. And we were doing a sort of dualistic lecture that I was telling what I know about where we're passing by, and he was telling or she was telling what she knew about. And with the policeman, it was the most fun of all because at each building in Vienna, he knew some crime story about it. <laughs> some normal crime story, some crime, sto crime reasons where most of all was jealousy, some private reasons, but also some great crimes like Carlos, the famous terrorist, also visited Vienna in 73, I think, and took the OPEC ministers as hostages. And at that period of time, we didn't even have any special police for that purpose because Vienna was this island somewhere, being neutral, having no trouble with terrorism at all. And so we were really, really curious and proud about that. This great guy, which we all know from TV, <laughs> comes here and he, he didn't take Austrians as hostages very politely. He took Arabian ministers, so we don't care that much. So <laughs> Austrians are, you know, are not very politically correct and quite racist like everybody, but they, we, we don't hide it. So it's a part of our culture. And Live TV was built, you know, huge cameras were built up in front of the building and we could see our simple policeman uh, showing up there and then there was some sort of incident and that one policeman was shot in the leg and uh, Carlson's team shot, definitely shot one of the ministers. But at the end, our minister came up there and accompanied Mr. Carlos and his team to the airport where a Russian airplane landed and took Carlos and his hostages on board and it was sent to Libya. 
Uh, there was a golden handshake, like I called it a handshake of our minister. Thank you for visiting us and thanks for, for getting away. But this is a quite funny story. But the but the result of this story was that first of all, OPEC built a new headquarter in Vienna, which was of course fenced off perfectly. And the Viennese police were thinking about probably they should have some sort of more modern uh, anti-terror troops as well. But they don't didn't know where to get educated and and. This quite sad story. Just a few months later, there was a second terrorist attack by uh, Lebanese terrorists on Israeli refugee, or Israeli immigrants from Russia, which were just coming by train, and nobody took care of the train, train so they could just hijack the whole train. And then also the Austrian police were thinking, "Oh, we have to improve." And, and another some weeks later, they they made a terror attack on the airport of Vienna at the El Al uh, desk. So there was a series of international terrorist attacks in this boring city of Vienna, and now we have a special force, like everywhere, really beautifully dressed, you know, man with all these, you know, SWAT units, which even show up for fo football matches. And uh, if you swim naked in a public swimming pool, it might be, in, during the night you might cause a sort of, you know, appearance of these guys. So there's a productivity of course, within this crime, which goes much further. And of course, OPEC then even changed the district. It, they didn't, they dislocated themselves to a place where, they, where there is a sort of better strategy in a, in a wider spatial defensive mode. But, uh, and, and of course, we again exchanged knowledge and, and we became very good friends. So like typically, if you have a part, if, if you make interviews with somebody in research, First, you hate him because he's the enemy, you know, from the, let's say, leftist or liberal cultural field, the policeman is the enemy, but, and I'm the enemy for him. But during the times, we became very good friends, and at the very end of, of, of this series of projects, I wanted to invite him for a lecture to Graz, to Stereo Autumn Festival, and he said, no, I don't want to talk anymore. This is boring. You know, we made that so often, I don't want to talk. And I asked him, yeah, what do you want to do then if you don't want to talk? He said, I want to sing. I said, <laughs> You can't sing, you know. What, what? No, but I have a band. <laughs> and I said, no, you know, you're kidding. I don't believe you, because he was really a chief police officer with his suit. Very, he looked a little bit like, like so let's say physically, he looked a bit like Colombo, but he was very well dressed <laughs> and <coughs> very well educated. He didn't look like having a rock band or something like that. And, but he insisted that he wants to play with a band instead of talking. And so I said, I, I told him, yeah, you know, I have only 200 euro. I can't invite a whole band with that budget. And he said, I, I shouldn't bother. You know, they, they come for free. I said, but you know, it's a four people PR system that you have to sleep somewhere. He said, don't care. We sleep in the jailhouse. <laughs> so I learned that the Graz jailhouse has guest cells for people working for the police forces to make cheap holidays. And I learned that they have a, that police that the police band has a PR system by themselves because they are playing together since quite a long time, and that this was much better equipment than all my student friends had ever in their life. And then they came up and and they played songs that were surprisingly or not surprisingly, they played very ancient Viennese songs about robbers, thieves, pimps, and criminals. So they were only playing such songs, which were all quite sad, a sort of Viennese Pannonian blues, and having a 13 string guitar, harmonica, but bass guitar. So blues rock uh, sort of music. And this chief of the criminal police didn't sing at all. He was just translating the texts to the audience <laughs> because they were in a very old uh, Viennese dialect, which nobody could understand. But for me, this was also interesting that even the criminals produce police, of course, and then the police is praising the criminals, which are the reason for the existence, which I would consider to be a very, very smart postmodern uh, thinking of the policeman. Of, co of course, it, they, they didn't do that consciously because I know that in the, in the 80s, when, 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 when Austrian public TV made very funny films about Austrian police, they were really pissed about being misrepresented. And in this series of TV movies, they also showed policemen starting to play in a band. 
And for me, it was quite surprising that these real policemen uh, mimet mimetically imitate what they have seen on TV, how they are represented as yeah, police, retired policemen playing in a rock band and singing songs about pimps and criminals. Um, and when I was talking about the, where they are used to play, and since that period of time, I always get emails where they play, and they have gigs, enormous amount of gigs and invitations. And the places they love most to play are the, rest, uh, the places of, the prosti of prostitution. So in the, they love to play in normal concert halls, but that's boring. That's the cultural field for intellectual idiots. They are the guys from the street, and they want to play where the street life, the authentic street life is, and that's in the red light district. And definitely, they are re regularly invited by the old pimps of Vienna to play their songs. And then you can see policemen singing the chorus with the old pimps, some ancient songs, which we don't understand because the language is out of fashion, and reunify in a sort of glorification of the good old times. Of course, we can think about that. It's also problematic about the, to, to glorify the good old times. But nevertheless, for me, this was quite surprising as a sort of culturalization where the police is even part of. But now we come, yeah, and in, the, in, this, in this last event, I, I also hired a punk, a late punk, you know, a 2000 year, uh, from the 2000s, some student who was, who was playing some anti-police songs. And there was a quite good atmosphere against the police when the, until the police came up. And when they had been on stage and sang their first two songs, all these people, either the students or artists, they were on the side of the police because they were, they were so convincing in, in, with, this, with this emotional music and this absurd situation. But this is not the lecture, now comes the lecture. <laughs> so, the, so, so the lecture is an is a introduction in a specific sort of critical geographical thinking that was introduced by British geographers, sociologists that some of them emigrated to the United States. And then the discourse was re-imported by some Americans to the German-speaking world and landed in Vienna 100 years after the discourse was started. And I was one of these people who, like in my early times, that I, I thought that I discovered some specific rock song in time. Later on, it turned out I was five years too late. And I think it was the same here. And I've, always, I've also been, during that period of time, I've also been into Los Angeles and before going to Los Angeles, I have, of course, read Mike Davis' book, City of Quartz. And that time, period of time, I didn't know about David Harvey at all, but there were some footnotes in Mike Davis' book about David Harvey. And of course, I found all the evidences in Los Angeles that I read about, because my, 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 let's say my view was completely pre-structured by, by reading that one and only book at that period of time. And when I came back, of course, I wanted to implement that in a little bit, not, not, not in the, let's say, not in the super intellectual style, but in a sort of Mike Davis popular culture style. So I, I didn't want to, sh to quote complicated philosophers' uh, sentences, but just popular culture productions. So I start with a movie called Fortress, a not very good movie. I don't know if you know it. It's available in every video shop. Uh, It's from 93, 1993, by Stuart Gordon, and the main role is played by Christopher Lambert. And the plot is like follows. <coughs> a young couple lives in a private controlled territory, so a state that is run by a company, sort of, let's say, post-democratic society. And which has a very strict birth control, and uh, she had lost her first baby, and they want to have a second baby, and she's pregnant, but being pregnant for the second time is forbidden in this regime, and so they try to escape from the territory by pretending to go on holidays. And at the border station, of course, they, they have to pass the body scanner, and they detect her pregnancy, and both of them are imprisoned. She's going to some women prison, and she's not seen anymore for one and a half hour during the movie, <coughs> while he is going to a male prison. And here you can see the transport, uh, the prisoner's transport, which is a quite martialic military car, which is going to the very center of this private territory 
into the safest prison you could imagine, which is in the middle of the desert. And the prison is, is a 30-story high building, which is not built up from floor, but down into the earth. It has some sort of air circulation on top. And in the very center is a tower with an elevator. And the elevator has a bridge which connects to the galleries. And at the galleries, there are individual cells which are lit from backside where the, where the prisoners live, I think, two or three in one cell. And up to that description, this is the, comp this is the perfect copy of the concept of Jeremy Bentham's panopticon, as, he descri as Foucault described it later in his book, that you have an architecture which has a central axis from where you can see all spaces of the space of, of the prison. Then you have several galleries where people know that they're seen from the central tower all the time, and they're even lit from the backside to be more visible. But in contrast to Bentham, in this movie they have a three-dimensional video camera which is driving around the ceiling of these galleries. So it can look to all sides and can control all these people all the time on a visual basis. But there's even a much harder device. It's not only the spatial control, it's also the media control. And when the prisoners enter the prison, they go to this sort of tunnel, and then the director is directly speaking to them. Uh, you will never be alone. So think about it. Don't misbehave. You will never be alone. And prisoners do not yet know, but then they learn what happens because they have to put their mouth on some sort of penis-like thing where they, the prison administration shoots a sensor into their belly. So it's bad script writing, of course, because how can this oops, oops, go inside and be fixed inside? So everybody has a built-in sensor, and this built-in sensor has a PSIS system, which means, means I think, a, it was psychological e system security <laughs> identification system. And it's scanning this guy. And it has these three lights on top. So if this car, and it's also, it's not only scanning, it's a GPS navigation, even before GPS, so that it knows where you are. But it also is, it's also measuring your, your brain streams. It's like a lie detector, or a, not a lie detector, but a, de a detector, detector which detects what you're thinking. If you're thinking legal things, there's a green light. If you're thinking semi-legal, dangerous things, then there's a red light and you get electroshocks. And if you're thinking something which is forbidden, there will be a red light and you will explode. And to make that understandable to everybody who, who watches the movie, in the, one of the first scenes, one of the colleagues, friends of Mr. Lambert, is just crossing one of the red lights and thinking about how to, that he would like to escape. And of course, he's exploding and everything is full of blood so that you understand that system. And so you can see this is the most perfect control system implemented by a private run nation for the sort of optimization of economic life within this sort of complex because it's an industry uh, complex that is a nation at the same time. But it's a Hollywood movie, so therefore there has to be a happy end. Uh, Mr. Christopher Lambert shares the cell with a typical black American, a typical Mexican American or Hispanic American, and a Jewish intellectual. <laughs> and day by day, they figure out how to transgress the control system. And the weak point is the director himself, who loves to have a lot of servants around him, who serve him personally. So they all volunteer to become servants of the director, because then they are quite close to the central computer machine, which is controlling themselves. And so they figure out how they can get rid of their uh, sensor. Of course, with a lot of blood, they would lose by taking it out. But they also, they also learn how, to, how they could properly uh, hack the computer. So, so at the end, all the friends of Christopher Lambert die at the last attempt to flee. But Christopher, he succeeds and escapes successfully. And then the museum director wants to join him. He also wants to escape. 
And then, surprisingly to all the audience, the museum, uh, the, museum the jailhouse director explodes himself. Because even the director was a prisoner of the system and had some uh, detector built in. And also quite bad script. <laughs> then Christopher Lambert somehow finds his girlfriend again, and she has a baby with her, and they escape to New Mexico and have a beautiful life for the future. <laughs> and during these guys are what are getting this thing implemented. They watch a screen, and the screen is telling them crime does not pay. So it's like, yeah. remember, crime does not pay. And within my own argumentation, I would argue, no, that's not true at all. Crime does pay, of course. And I follow the old guy called Karl Marx, who was a German intellectual, as you all know. I don't think that he was a very uh, subtle, ironic guy. But he wrote a very nice article called about über die Produktivkraft, about productivity, where he speaks definitely about the productivity of crime. And he is quoting Bernard de Mandeville. I don't know if you know him. He's a poet and philosopher and scientist of econo economy of 70, 1705, who, who wrote about, uh, in a poetic way, about the theory of economy. And he wrote this book called The Fable of the, Bee, of the Bees, where he, where he mentions that the criminal is not only producing the crime, but also all the measurements against crime. And he, Bernard de Montville, mentions uh, the burglar, or the robber, and the locksmith. So the locksmith is producing a beautiful lock that should block off a burglar. But the burglar has to be smart to develop new devices to open this lock. And then the locksmith has to develop a new lock, a better lock. And so Bernard de Montville argues that there is a sort of competition between locksmiths and burglars, which, which makes them better and better and better. And he, 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 he uses this metaphor as a sort of argumentation for, for pre-capitalist society. And Marx takes over this, this quotation and says, yes, criminals don't only produce crime, but they produce also the pro this sort of productivity. They make otherwise boring and sleeping people more active. So as long as you're endangered, you're aware. As long as you're no more endangered, you become lazy and become vulnerable. As long as somebody kicks you in the arse, you're, you keep yourself busy. As long as nobody touches you anymore, you forgot about it. But Marx does not only talk about this sort of competition of the burglar and the locksmith. He also talks about the moral discourses that if there is no evil one, nobody knows what the good is. And uh, you know, in Cold War, we had in the West we had communists as the evil one, so we knew that uh, capitalist is good one, the good one. The communists had us in the West as the evil one, and uh, so they knew that they were the good one. The Catholics invented the devil, so everybody's automatically on the good side. Maybe the Protestants are not as good. So that each society has this sort of construction of the evil, which they necessarily have to have to reestablish a system of, of values. And so Marx also argues that crime is not only producing prevention, it's also pr producing the punitive system, the prison, the police, the lawyer, the professor, and the author. But it's also producing journalists who write about it, philosophers who argue whether it's good or bad. It's producing all the fine arts, because there wouldn't have been any Greek drama without discussing about crime. Though nobody would have ever went to the cinema if there wouldn't have happened a crime, or even to the theater if there wouldn't have had happened crime in the theater. And so he's speaking about, let's say, a sort of physical, physical productivity and the cultural productivity of crime. And he even mentions two examples from literature. One is Richard III by Shakespeare, which I've seen. Very complicated. Everybody's killing everybody. At the end, one survives. And this one is the king, of course. And this one is the one who hired Shakespeare to write the piece, to make him the legitimate king. And the other one is the piece called The Robbers by Schiller, which is less complicated. It's uh, some sort of senior uh, aristocratic family which have a black sheep. One son wants to, uh, wants to join the bourgeois idea, so he's kicked off of the court. And he 
by accident meets some nice guys in the forest and becomes the, the, the chief of the robbers. And later, when he wants to return back home to the court, there's no chance to get reintegrated, and so he has to be killed at the end. So it's a pre-enlightenment pre, pre uh, theater piece. And again, surprisingly, I saw these theater pieces in Vienna in Rabenhof Theater performed by one of the chief police psychologists of Vienna, who was hired by the theater to play Shakespeare and Schiller in a stage set of Playmobil figures. So that, that was the, the sort of maquette of the castle, Playmobil figures. And he was moving the figures, had several video cameras here and a huge projection. On the projection, you could, could see them, the close-ups. And then he had a flip chart where he was describing who is killed. So you know, Richard, Richard I is killing Richard II, and, and then it's Henry, and, and, and they made an X, so he, that he died. And in between, he was talking about his private experience of real cases. And then he got back to the, to the pieces. And it was a really exciting theater performance for, for two hours with a usual break, like in normal theater, where you get beer or champagne. And he left police after being such a successful theater player. <laughs> and I will start now with speaking German now with the spatial aspects of the productivity of crime. So if you, if you want to prevent yourself or your environment from danger, then there are different cate categories. We all know that the first architecture was built for the reason of protecting oneself and one's goods from weather or uh, natural disasters or enemies. And the first urban agglomerations were built because of the reason of trade and storing the goods that you grew on the meadows and was also, was also built for the reason of protecting oneself. And the, and the enemies could come either from outside or from inside. Usually a society uh, projects all the dangers to the outside. This is more comfortable that the evils are always outside and not inside. But we know that this changed <laughs> radically uh, during the last period of time, or since ever, but we, we always try to project that the, that the danger is from outside. And if it's from outside, we have different, different metaphors for animals. This is from a quite famous philosopher who brought that up exactly in the year two, uh, September, after September 11, when, he, when everybody wanted to say something smart about terrorist attacks. And so he argued that the first enemy was the wolf who went on four legs and went around your neighborhood. And it was very easy to fence him off because he just needed to make a fence. That's easy with the wolf. The second one was the rat, which had a different tactic. She could dig in the ground and go beneath it. So the, so the fence had to be extended four meters minus. Then came the bugs, which could fly. So they could go across uh, the fence as well. And the last enemy was attack was the virus, which was already in ourselves. And there was a sort of yeah, metaphorical hint to the, to the sleepers, sleeper cells of, of, of uh, contemporary terrorists, terrorist gangs. And the, and the preventions towards how to keep these dangers off in spatial aspects could be also categorized in a sort of, let's say, a yeah, market system like Graham Kohler's did it with his own works that he used small, medium, large, and x large as categories. And let's say what happens. Small might be small buildings, small attacks. In our case, it's small buildings. Medium might be medium attacks or medium buildings, which is not not a door anymore, but maybe a house. Large can be almost semi-urban environment, and X large is, of course, a very large environment. And at that period of time, when I started with my project, I had no other idea than just copying the ideas from Raymond Kolhas. It's the usual stuff, you know, lack of self-confidence. Just take some quotations from somebody who's really famous, and people will believe you anyway. So small is what I mentioned before, is the, comp is, is the competition between locksmiths and burglars. This is a very, very old lock at a door, and you can see it's not very difficult to copy the key. So it's not very helpful. For, it's, 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 more, it's, more, it's more securing oneself that you closed it, and so, there are some animals in the world which are not smart enough to open it, but there's human race and even the, 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 the most stupid representatives of our 
race would be able to open that door. Yeah, there's even a fascist typology of key up there, I see. But then, of course, the locks got more advanced and advanced. And what's quite interesting was that in the, in the Renaissance period of time, there were even these locks were even presented in very expensively made books, which no burglar could afford, as like Wundermaschinen. Here you can see it's not to open up a small door, it's just like open up the door of a castle. So, so you could interpret this as a sort of handbook for terrorism to, to break up the doors of the castle of somebody else. And as you also can see, the locks get very beautiful, but also the, the devices for unlocking the locks get quite beautiful, like special machines. And indeed, at that period of time, there had been competitions of locksmiths that they offered their lock plus 1,000 gulden if somebody can break it off. And some of them became professional burglars, and others later became professional locksmiths because they were so good at breaking up the locks, so they, could, they knew how to develop the, the, the other one. In the 20s and 30s, uh, police even made exhibitions to show how you can, one can protect oneself from thieves. That is from the police exhibition in the tw 21, I think, in Berlin. That happens to somebody who tries to steal something, then the, the window comes down. There was, of course, much more advanced technology at the same time, and I have been to this, you know, typical architecturist visit to Villa Tugendhat today, and Daniela del Hammer Tugendhat, the <coughs> grandchild, which is living in Vienna, told me that Tugendhat's family had the first uh, alarm system in this city by infrared, which was the newest of everything. So, it was, so this villa was not open to all sides. It looked open to all sides, but the back side they had this very fancy alarm system. And of course, for selling, for selling security systems, you have to build up fear. So these guys, which look like football goalies from the interwar period, are typical criminals you have to fear. Nowadays, this doesn't work that much. So a German company made a photograph of Frankfurt from a position where it looks like an American town. And they sent and says, not all streets can be safe. But your home can be safe if you buy our Siedler video surveillance system for the door bell. And it was quite funny because here you can speak to the people who, open, who knocks at the door and you can see his or her face. And I was once invited to German, to German city to make this lecture. And this lecture was surprisingly sponsored by Siedler. So, you know, as being a super hypercritical person, you cannot escape from being misused by these guys. But these guys are very interested why I use their image. And I told them, yes, because this is completely wrong, you know. We all know from police records that the most dangerous place on earth is your own apartment. So the number one murder site is the sleeping room of a couple which is married since quite a long time. So the sleeping room is much more dangerous than the street. So it, normally you should make it opposite, that people can go to the door and have a look if, if there is no battle in the living room or in the sleeping room happening to protect them from, you know, from hitting each other. And so they said, oh, smart idea. Yeah, we have to, cha we have to change the, you know, the, the, the PR campaign. This is a typical example of medium-sized social control system, not by evil capitalists, but by the Red Vienna City Administration. As you might know, this is Karl Marxhof, which is the most famous inner yard uh, housing block of Vienna. And the, and the, and the basic idea of, of these housing blocks was that all the staircases have the doors to the inner yard so that the, the children do not run to the dangerous streets but run to the inner yards where, where you have some huge temples. One is the temple of kindergarten and one is the temple of, of, of the laundry. common bath and laundry. So either they, they run inside and either get washed or get educated by professionals. And, and if, they, if they have if they want to go to the street, then they pass by some professionals who supervise them. And this system is, this, they didn't talk in the same way than we talk nowadays. They were more, so the, the danger was alcohol in the streets and gang warfare. So they wanted to protect the kids and educate these kids in these, let's say, city-run institutions which were in the center of the housing blocks. 
It was quite funny when I went to Los Angeles, I saw almost the same typology, which was also famous, uh, well known in uh, some f TV series, Melrose Place. That was a super private environment, one gate where you get in, and inside was no kindergarten but the swimming pool, but they were fenced off. And as, we, as, as you know, if you have seen this series, they are controlling each other perfectly. And the, sa the same happens in, the, in, the, in this Viennese housing block. So if you go in as, an, as, an, as a foreigner, they immediately, immediately, immediately somebody detects you as a foreigner. So it works perfectly as a uh, social control device. And in the 80s, this, was, this concept was taken over by feminist planners, again, for, for, for producing safe neighborhood in housing blocks. This is the, the, other, this is the other appeal. Uh, influence of Czech Cubism in the city of Vienna for the, for the main yard, which has a quite militant appearance and was interpreted by the conservatives as being a fortress to fight them in the civil war, which definitely came only one year after the, uh, the building was finished. This is a series of photographs of a German <coughs> friend of mine, Mark Reder, who photographed gated communities in the United States of America. This is a very decent gated community, and, you, and we all know that in, in the United States, people are very much aware or paranoid about the value of their house or of the ground. So there's the general imagination that the value of a house, until very recently, there was the general imagination that the value of a house rises forever and ever and ever and ever. So if you want to invest, you will get three times as much back if you, if, you, if you move. And Americans are very mobile, so if they move from one place to the other just because they found a different job, they want to sell their house with a profit, of course. So, and then they have an, another paranoia that they have the opinion that poor people in the neighborhood would decrease the value of their ground. Black people in the neighborhood would decrease the value of their home, uh, sort of non-beautiful environment might decrease the value of, your, of their home. So they control their territory and fence themselves off. This is a very beautiful sort of gate, which has, a, again, like the image I showed first, this is much more the necessary. It's obviously about, about the symbolic representation that we have a gate. You know, we, we don't have such a cheap beginner's gate. We have a really beautiful entrance palace. And while at the same time the so-called poor people were living in the abandoned social housing blocks in the inner suburbs or of, of the big cities, and this is a series of photographs by Jose Vargas, who made photographs of social housing blocks at that period of time. And, uh, and these were somehow produced as being the, the centers of danger and criminality, and some of them really had been the center of danger and criminality, but for, for, real, for real estate brokers, it made much sense to make them even more dangerous as they had been, <clears throat> to make all the, the people which, are living, which had been living there and had a little bit of money on the side to escape from the city and to buy a house outside with one of these cheap mortgages which were sold uh, during the last decade and that led to this real estate disaster in 2008 and the whole economic crisis by producing a paranoia and selling houses to everybody, even to those who cannot afford, and then to speculate on the, on the insurances of these uh, mortgages. And this is the very absurd example from South Africa, where the, 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 the car stays a little bit around because he's protecting the poor people in, the, in their own neighborhood uh, from escaping uh, in, the, in their own township from escaping at the period of time when it was not allowed. Of course, this photograph was taken in a, in a more, in the past when, it, when, when the situation was more terrible than nowadays. But nevertheless, uh, there's, a sort of, there's a sort of construction of fear that produces uh, social movement and, and geographical movement within the city, and that again produces desire and, and can rise up the prices from houses. And I... In the, while I was re doing research, I found a book by Neil Smith, who died just some month ago. He's a, again, a British educated geography or, original 
from Scotland teaching at, at CUNY University in New York. And he, he wrote a book called The Revanchist City where he, where he showed how, how real estate brokers are in the United States are somehow yeah, kicking out people from the neighborhood. And to me, this was not new because that happened in Austria as well. But the American method methodology is, is a little bit harsher. So they, they said they, they, support, they support deviant people to move into a specific neighborhood, then all the normal people get panic and it disappear. The prices run down. You can buy it very cheaply. Then you offer the government a program for refurbishment and upgrading of the neighborhood. You get subsidy. And uh, then you get some other people in to make an enormous revenue just by these uh, measurements. And he was, he was doing his work on, on Harlem, uh, parts of Harlem in New York. But I, I, I knew the same people in Graz where, where there was some famous lawyer who was the most important real estate broker in the city. And he hired homeless people, punk musicians, drug addicts to move into specific objects uh, to move the other people out of the building. And at the same time, he opened up building sites at all sides of the building and paid the, 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 the truck driver to demolish one of the central columns of the building so that the building has to be dismantled anyway because of danger. And this, this, this guy is never ever accused for anything, but he had some, some let's say, officers. And one of these officers is driving a Jaguar uh, Cabrio, and he, he goes to jail every second year. But, but he's well paid for that, so no problem. And officially, he's also homeless and, and has no property at all. Then we come to, to a very specific crime. When I, this is really long ago, and when, I, when, I, when I, I wanted to make a book, and the book was finished almost, and then September 11 happened, and I had to rewrite everything, because September 11 is something which was so strong that you cannot leave it aside. But it was, what was quite interesting to me is that before September 11, there was already a movie showing what will happen afterwards, and this movie was based on a terror attack on the World Trade Center, which happened in 95 or 93. In 93, there was the first terrorist attack on the World Trade Center, which everybody forgot, by some Arabian guys, which were led by some sheikh, which was bl almost blind. Everybody knows him now. And this terror attack was the reason for a, for a Hollywood movie called The Siege, where you can see a series of absurd hijacks and murders of when American GIs kill several Arabian priests in the desert and then starts an attack of uh, a series of attacks in the United States on public buildings and during that movie we learn that that all these terrorists were educated by the American CIA, CIA to fight against the Russians in Afghanistan but later were let down and now started to fight against the Americans as a revenge for uh, not being supported. And this, this was produced exactly in the, in the year when these terrorists were, were at court. And only five years later, the real attack happened. And the real attack had, of course, an enormous productivity on discourse, intellectual discourse, on the legal system that all the laws were enforced for controlling oneself, for controlling the others, for implementing uh, security systems, for attacking any nation in the world which is threatening the United States. And it also implemented, of course, physical improvements in planning. What already happened before was that the United States and Britain already had a very strong, let's say, part of urban design was security design. So not only social design, like I showed in the Viennese housing block, but also like design against crime, securing your neighborhood, uh, pimping up your, your house, and also implementing several professional tribes within the <coughs> system. But after September 11, this was radically improved. And very surprisingly, only very short, I think three weeks after September 11, the, the, the architecture gallery, one architecture gallery in New York promoted a new exhibition about new ideas for September 11, built it higher, beat them down, so they just followed the you know, military arguments of the government, but also new skyscraper designs appeared immediately. This is a product by Sir Norman Foster in cooperation with 
all the Arab and partners, which show now the terrorist attack safe skyscraper. You can drive in with hundreds of airplanes from all sides. It will never ever crash down. It is a double twisted uh, system with several <coughs> connections to each other, hundreds of escape ways. If, if you would destroy this system, it just falls down and is caught by the next one. So it's the super elastic uh, best case design which you, co which you could imagine. So, and, and, the, and, and, and because because the Swiss Swiss Re, Swiss Rück, also Schweizer Rück, Swiss Re Insurance had to pay such a lot of money for, to the owner of, of, of these uh, buildings in New York. Of course, nowadays, if you want to build a new skyscraper, you have to implement the newest technology. So all skyscrapers are much more expensive than that period of time and have to implement at least half of these new developments I'm showing here. And also this, this attack, as I mentioned, was was uh, foreseen in some Hollywood movies. And in one of my early presentations, I invited a security expert who, I didn't believe him anything, but he was quite con convincing with his stories. And he said that he was part of the first terrorist attack on the World Trade Center when, some, when the guys drove down to the parking house with 500 kilograms of check <laughs> explosives. <laughs> so very well known in all you know, terrorist groups. So. And, but nothing happened. Hundreds of cars were completely demolished, but the house was still standing. And of course, from that period of time, each, each garage had a video surveillance system. And each van, which could carry 500 kilogram of these Czech uh, explosives, would have been stopped and controlled if, you want, if it wants to drive down to the garage. In the same period, of, in, in the 80s, the IRA, Irish Republican Army, started or expanded the civil war against England, expanded the civil war to the territory of England and to the territory of London and made some very successful bomb attacks in the financial district of London. That led to some sort of very nice improvements. First of all, very strange plazas. <coughs> because if this, is, if this is the danger that somebody drives into a house with 500 kilogram, then the result is this nice area. This is not a deconstructivist art piece or some you know, fancy architecture. It is fancy architecture, but first of all, it's defensive architecture. So we have these elements. So no, no, no car can drive up there. Only in case of emergency, they can automatically uh, move them down, and then the car can up, drive up there. This is, these are all sculpturesque barriers to prevent bombs from being brought too close to this building. And it was quite successful, but only for four weeks. So this place was completely empty. This was a bit too cool to sit or to hang around. And it's the Federal Plaza building in New York, uh, in San Francisco, so an official administration building. And the businessman didn't want to sit here. They just went to some pub in the, in the break. But it was immediately dis discovered by skateboarders. <laughs> so a month later, it had to be made skateboard proof because these people didn't want to have skateboarders there. And as you can see, they made then these sort of special spikes on all the concrete elements which are attractive for skateboarders to, to fence the skateboarders off. And so, so, so this brings up a very absurd combination of dangers. So on one side, real terrorists are a danger. On the other side, some skateboarders can become a productive danger. Of course, they would make huge skateboard parks out of, outside of the city to keep them in their territory, in a territory they, where they want them to be. And in, 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 the, in the British discourse, they, they, they discussed since a while a very funny concept. In, in, Lon in, in England, as you know, they have this very specific habit at the weekends, Friday night and Saturday night, uh, half of the population gets radically drunk. Uh, no difference between male and female people anymore. And people then, of course, get enthusiastic in transgressing uh, usual behavior, which can become a, a slight problem in s some places. And so nowadays, first of all, they implemented real, uh, video surveillance everywhere, 
even against uh, drunken people. But on the other hand side, they were planning specific parts in the city as places where people must have, so which are designed to be get drunk. So if you want to get drunk, go there and you know kill yourself and beat yourself up with your friends, but leave the others alone in their part. And, and this, this is really done strategically. So it comes from hooligan organization or hooligan fighting. So we, we have the problem of hooligans. We have to canalize their routes through the city. Now we have the same problem with people who are, are drunk. So we have to canalize their routes through the city. And this gets really paranoid, but produces a lot of smart jobs for people who are developing video surveillance systems where misbehavior is detected by the camera. And then somebody in the alarm, set, in the alarm system has to do any decision, so is he an actor, is he, is he only cool, or is he drunk? So do, this, that, do these young guys only greet themselves, uh, or do they deal drugs, or do they start war? So, so then it's, usually we know these guys are busy with drinking beer and eating kebab, and in some cases they even haven't, haven't ha do not ha hire anybody who can watch the monitors. I, I was once joining a tour in Graz where some hypercritical guys wanted to go to the police station to watch the surveillance system. And then we went to the surveillance system and we saw a lot of monitors and no policemen who had time to watch them. And then we were asking, what are you doing? And they said, we're doing nothing, you know? Mm -hmm. We are busy controlling the, 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 cross, the, main, the main roads. And, and only if there's a soccer match, then they get one policeman to watch the monitors, but not the monitors that, so that, 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 you know, that surveil all the city, but only the monitors on the, on, on, on the route from the train station to the stadium and back. And when the, when the match is over, he, is, he can go home. So, so there, is even not enough, there are even not enough people to do that. One quite interesting thing that I figured out in this research was that there is something called parallel architecture existing. Uh, since a lot of IT business, or a lot of business becomes more and more digitized, and of course all the financial transac uh, transac transitions, uh, the computers are more important than the building. And during September 11 and the first attack on the World Trade Center, it turned out that the insurance value of the, bill of the people was very small. The insurance value of the building was quite high, but the insurance value of all the computer equipment was 10 times as high as all the rest. Despite the fact that most of the banks already had some parallel architectures, that means people go to Wall Street because it's a cool place to go, you have to go there, but they have exactly the same infrastructure somewhere in New Jersey already built up, and in case of danger of attack, these, mm -hmm. these employees just go to New Jersey to continue to work and not to the Wall Street because there shouldn't be any break off in financial business because that is a much more, much more dangerous than if hundreds of banks are exploded. And so a British guy made, it, made this sort of book about these parallel architectures that the most valuable things are not in buildings that look valuable, there's in some anonymous bunkers somewhere outside. And we know a lot of stories that, you know, conspiracy theory, Mona Lisa is not Mona Lisa anymore, it's a, it's a fake. The real Mona Lisa is somewhere in a bunker. The real, the real treasure is not, is not in, the, in the national bank, but somewhere else, et cetera, et cetera. And we come back to the very normal example, the city of Vienna. As you can see, that is the Renaissance bastion, which almost every European city had at that period of time. The one of Vienna was quite successful. It was never, ever conquered by anybody. Only the Osmanic troops uh, started to to try to get by underground tunnels inside, which were formerly used by the priests to get to the women cloisters uh, for some deviant reason. And as and, and as you all know, that the, the the part around this the part around this wall had to be completely free from buildings, and the reason was again a military strategic argument that they had artillery on, on the wall and they wanted, to, they wanted to see the enemies when they approach and when they approach here they start to shoot and they're dead. So that was a concept. But when the city grew and became so dense 
they, they couldn't see the enemies anymore. They could only see the enemies when they were here. And at that period of time, the enemies had, of course, the same weapons than, the, than they had. And the weapons could shoot much, high, much, much further than, uh, than this distance was. So at the beginning, at the beginning of the city design, the artillery was rather weak, so the, so the non-built land was that small. It became larger, 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 and then it ended here. Here are all the summer palaces of the aristocrats. Then the aristocrats said, no, you know, I want this mantle, my baroque palace, you know, idiot emperor. And besides, the weapons are so strong that it makes no sense anyway. And in that period of time, which was also early enlightenment, uh, Ringstrasse in Vienna was built, and as you all know, Ringstrasse is the Hausmann, Hausmannization of Vienna. But what they, they made a competition, but in the competition was one of the chief officers of the Austrian emperor's army to control the design. And what he wanted to have and insisted on to be built was to have three huge military barracks in the center and the corners of the Ringstrasse. So that you have troops here, here, and here, and that they could easily gather around Ringstrasse. Why? Because 1948 was the bourgeois revolution in Vienna, or the attempt of a bourgeois revolution, because the revolution lasted for four months. Some students uh, robbed the, <coughs> the weapons from the emperor's uh, soldiers, and the emperor was on holiday somewhere anyway, so they took control of the city. But from the point of view of an emperor, of course, a normal murder is, bullsh is peanuts, you know. The emperor doesn't care about normal murder, but, but declaring a republic is, of course, the utmost crime for an aristocratic emperor. So they had to be beaten, of course, and he, he collected all the Austrian, you know, army from all the provinces, and then the anti-revolution was done within half an hour, and Ringstrasse was built. But the emperor was always bankrupt because he started one war and one battle after the other, which, and he needed money, and so he had to make this compromise, compromise and ask the bourgeois classes to finance his wars. And they said, yes, I will lend you money if you let, let us build on this beautiful place, which then became this famous Ringstrasse. So Ringstrasse is not only the, the representative place for the new bourgeois classes and the, and the republic, but it's also a military defense system now against the revolutions from the suburbs, which were the working classes. And which I, I don't have this drawing here, but if somebody, if somebody knows the information, he will, he will find it. There is, a, there is a military barrack. There's an artillery station, there's an artillery station, there's a military barrack, there's an artillery station, there's an artillery station. The streets are exactly that, pra that, that wide, like the battalion needs to march in formation. The sidewalks are exactly that wide that, that the cavalry can, drive, can, can ride aside. And they even made the stones larger than Paris, that people cannot throw them so easily on each other. So they, th they, they just thought about everything. And this is a nice, this is one of the other outcomes of the IRA attacks on the city of London. Uh, <clears throat> they thought about controlling all the cars that drive into the whole city and invented a one-way system in the city of London and invented several control points where all the number plates and faces of the people who drive into the city of London are controlled. Later on, some other banks complained that they are not part of that system, so they had to extend it and they called it the Ring of Steel. And it had a buy effect. Nowadays in London, as you know, they have a city mount, so people have to pay if they go in. And they use exactly the same control stations now for charging for car drivers to enter the city. And now the pollution in the city radically decreased. So what was once done against terrorists is now a quite useful device. And the ring of steel is a term that was developed in the war against the IRA in Ireland, but now was appropriated for this sort of strategy, also there is no steel used, there are only video cameras used. But surprisingly, there was a ring of steel at the summit in Genova. This is quite long ago as well. This was, a, at that period of time, I think it was a G8 summit. <clears throat> it was the period of time when, when, when Genova was, was gentrified and refurbished, and so all the powerful people of the world were meeting in the harbor in huge cruise ships that were 
landing there and had their you know, conference about the future of economy and blah, blah, blah. And they were quite scared about terror attacks, so they built this sort of beautiful art installation around the whole harbor. And they also had zones like the Fortress movie, so there was a green zone outside, a yellow zone where you only were allowed to enter with a specific passport or for being a non-dangerous <coughs> person. And then there was the red zone where nobody was allowed to go. And as you, uh, as, as you know, during this Genova summit, there was one young person shot by the police because he entered the wrong zone and misbehaved on the wrong place and policemen got panicked and shot him. But there was also some conspiracy theory that Berlusconi wanted to use this sort of summit for, for implementing so, sort of more powerful post-fascist laws in Italy, which failed. So this is part one. Part two is probably shorter. So crime sells, of course. And I want now to speak about this sort of cultural productivity of crime. <coughs> that crime is quite important, as I mentioned, to, to, f to find oneself in a group. There's a theoretician called Vanessa Schwartz, which spoke about the, the use of crime as a sort of Yeah, just just topic to talk and to bring people together. And also as a sort of engine of 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 how to perceive the city and also about a sort of reason for for reorganizing the city. But first to the to the reason to talk. She speaks about there's some murder in the aristocratic times of, of, of French monarchy when the monarch the monarch himself wasn't allowed to talk to his servants. But then there was a series of murders which was so attractive that some newspapers were just writing about one murder case during half a year. And the emperor he even, even started to talk with his servants about this case. And as we all know, each, each nation has a sort of uh, specific original story which is somehow combined with crime. Uh, Austria doesn't have that that much because our origin is that our Habsburg emperor killed the Czech king which is not really a good story, but for the others it's a good story because you, know, you, you become victim of some evil Austrian idiot uh, who, sent a, who sent a murder. But, but all that, many communities need some sort of threat from outside to find each other, to, to force each other. And, and, and they're speaking about the so-called idea of the imagined community of a nation which only functions if you have some sort of specific common experiences. In non-civilized nations, you need a war with somebody else to find each other. In more civilized, you have a football match or ice hockey tournament to know what, who you are, for example. But crime works most perfectly in that sense. So it brings all the people together and, and it reminds them who is, who is on the wrong side and who is on the right side. And she also speaks about the attractive aspects of crime, like uh, in the many museums show uh, mur showed murder scenes in the 19th century. Many, many newspapers showed murder scenes. Many mu newspapers made pr uh, published crime stories to keep the people as readers. But also, as you can see, even land producers showed uh, a policeman who is a, he, who is a lamp from Osram and who saves the world by beating the burglars. And it was also a period of time of scientific perception of the city, that you have to count where what, which crimes happen. This is remade just recently by a student of myself. This is a crime mapping where the most of the crimes happen in Graz. Since in Graz uh, no, almost no crimes are, are happening, she, she combined all the crimes and made this sort of Excel diagram and turned on the button to make it more dramatic, dramatic, dramatic. And now we have a really beautiful skylight of crime. But it also, it also led to the idea to make photographs of the city. And this is a series of photographs by Jakob Arne Ries from 1898, who photographed the slums of New York. He was hired by the local police to make photographs of the dangerous parts. But while doing the photographs, he became somehow a social activist and changed the side. But he is the inventor of social documentary in photography. So if there wouldn't have been police, 
to send him out, maybe this sort of technique would have never ever been developed because of course only those people working for the government could afford a camera at the period of time. And it also, but on the same time it drove also sort of the desires for the danger. So if this is dangerous, the slum, the ghetto, then there had been people, especially young people, who were desperately, let's say, <coughs> searching for these supposedly dangerous places and singing songs about it. And this is what I played at the very beginning. This is Grandmaster Flash, a 1983 hit, where they speak about the urban environment as a dangerous jungle. And they, you know, the ghetto busters, they are the only heroes who know the city and they know how to survive. So it's a sort of heroization of oneself, and I uh, know myself in early times that I wanted to behave exactly the same, but I always grew up in cities which were so boringly safe uh, that there was no reason to fear. But this is, but this is not new. This has a tradition. The tradition with the jungle starts already in 18th century, in the mid of 19th century with Balzac. Balzac, as you know, is a French writer who wrote about the city and he wrote about the urban underground, about the jungle, and several other French authors followed him and invented the Indian, you know, the street Indian. It's a romantic uh, European approach toward the American stories. And, <clears throat> and when they invented the crime stories, they invented the criminal as the expert on the city who is fighting with the policeman about the knowledge and about the control of the city. And each city had some sort of these photographic, photograph experts to look for the dangerous places of the city. And also the city of Vienna had some photographs like that. It's a couple of a journalist and a, and a lawyer who photographed Vienna by night and the places where the homeless and the poor people lived. But they called the lecture uh, around the Viennese quarters of poverty and crime. And they had to held it 300 times because it was so successful. And then they made a book about it, which was a bestseller in each bourgeois household had it. People became so incredibly curious about where the poor and criminal uh, live. And they made this sort of series of photographs like film, but pre-filmic. Karlsplatz in Vienna and in this weird building to the left is an entrance to the canal system. And in the canal system, you find the people sleeping. And they made that all several times, but at the end of their presentation, they showed some suburban guys uh, which are fighting each other. So this is the dangerous suburb. Of course, as you can imagine, that period of time to make a photograph, had a, they had a very long exposure time. So they all had to pose for these attacks. So nothing is authentic. And when I've been to Los Angeles, I saw some, some, to me, similar things. I bought a magazine about real estate business in Los Angeles because I wanted to know how much apartments cost. And the cover story was where the boys are. And they made a mapping of Los Angeles. Oops, sorry. They made a mapping of Los Angeles where you could see gang territories. And the gang territories were marked in colors and the colors were standing for the danger degree from one of hooligans to ten blo cold-blooded killers. And of course, if you, know, if, if you have a house in, a, in the rolling 20 Crips territory, uh, you get a little bit confused, you know, that, oh, we have the most dangerous gang in our neighborhood. Uh, what to do with my house, you know? And then, of course, I was getting in my car and was driving around there, and mm -hmm, where are they? And surprisingly, I was... I couldn't find them. <laughs> but every American is afraid because every American knows what it means. And we thought, okay, I don't see any you know, sneakers on the trees. I, there was no drive-by shooting. And when I was going to some party of friends, I got lost. And I get, got to a gas station. I figured out that nobody speaks English there. So I asked some young kids which had Adidas dress and they looked like from MTV. And they were quite polite and told me the way. And later I get to the party and told them that I was lost. Uh, I'm sorry I'm late because I was lost. And they said, yeah, where have you been lost? Yeah, at this gas station. And I asked these nice kids. They said, oh, God. <laughs> that, I didn't know. You know, they, had, they looked just like, you know, they had the golden chains and looked quite cool. And, but who knows, you know, if, if, if I would have 
believe this thing, I wouldn't even have stopped or other places. And of course, this, of course, these mappings have an, have an, and these mappings would have an influence on the city design and the American concept. It has a rather heavy, heavy influence. If, if there would be a peak of crime, then there would be, the consequence would be just dismantle the whole neighborhood because it's too dangerous. And this is not, this is not a joke because a friend of mine was, as an urbanist, was invited to Baltimore and they showed them some dangerous places and the concept they have to solve it. And what they showed them was blowing up uh, the housing blocks proudly. And then the Europeans wanted to complain. Uh, but it, it turned out that they should, that, that this was not wanted to be questions. And, and also in films, of course, some specific representations of the city started already in the 20s. <clears throat> this is Metropolis. And in, as in, Metro, in Metropolis, you, you know that the urban segregation is not, not horizontal, that the poor are living outside and the rich are living inside or the other way around, but the rich are living on the very top of the skyscrapers and the poor are living in the underground system and beneath the underground system are the revolutionaries which are waiting to, to tear down the concept. That continues in, in other movies. And I want to end with a very nice movie, which is my, my favorite movie uh, explaining urban theory. I don't know if you know it. The name of the movie is a Bernhard Rose film. <laughs> it starts with a, sky, with a helicopter uh, filming uh, the streets of Chicago in a very accurate rectangular way. And the titles are driving in accompanied by the music of Phil Glass. And then they come to a street crossing, introducing the main actors. Then to another street crossing, and then the camera ends on top of the University of Illinois Chicago, the outdoor auditorium. And then there is a cut, and we are in a lecture about urban anthropology. And then there is some sort of urban intellectual professor like me who is talking about the dangers of the city and about how to do research in the city, how to make real research. And he wants to encourage his students not to sit on their tables in the university, but to go out to the neighborhood and, do, and see the real thing. So not, not only reading about the city, but doing real research. And he has, typical American, he has a favorite doctor student or PhD student, which also has a love affair with him. This seems to be normal in the United States. And this, this girl, Virginia Madsen, the actor, wants to work about the myth of a ghost who is living in the most depressed neighborhood of Chicago and who is killing one child after the other. That's what the people say. And so, and the name of this guy is Candyman. And Candy Man is, of course, the name of the movie. And the movie is a normal horror movie, but with several script writers who studied urban anthropology before, obviously. So now the, now the, now, now the, the student gets in a car with a friend and drives to this neighborhood. And while they're driving to the neighborhood, the camera is no more in the angel's perspective, like in the beginning, but it's on a, let's say, half height. So you can see parts of the social life, but you don't get a grasp on it yet. And when these people arrive in this, depressed housing block. The camera gets down on eye level immediately. And the both young urban researchers get into a block which is controlled by gangbusters. Then they go up to the apartment where this man should have lived before. They ask some neighbors and they say, no, no, don't go there. And they go inside and inside they watch the plans and they figure out that they are several apartments inside each other, and you can, enter, you can enter one apartment from one apartment to the other if you pull off the mirror above the sink, then there is the, you know, then there is the mirror of the other apartment, and then you can get to the next apartment, and you can, can get from one apartment to the next apartment to the next apartment to the next apartment, and the, and the longer they go, this is quite interesting because there are much more apartments than you can see from outside, so it's a, they end up in a labyrinth, and this labyrinth, Candyman should have lived. And the interesting thing is, it's almost invisible. She makes photographs, and she makes notes, 
and she can see, she sees a huge, almost invisible, a huge scra graffiti of a black guy with a huge mouth who is somehow uh, eating the person or spitting the person who, who comes through the wall because the, all the wall is his face. And then, surprisingly, the ghost appears. So a very beautiful black guy appears with, with one hand, and this one hand is this iron thing, and he takes possession of the girl, which is a very strange situation in the movie, because it looks, like, it looks a bit like sexual intercourse, but on the other hand side, so he's penetrating her physically and mentally, and, and then he disappears and he's in her. This is a very nice tragedy of this man. It turns out that he was a black guy who got unemployed, so he's a victim of, let's say, post fordist uh, modernization. Uh, got kicked out of the neighborhood, started revenge, wanted to fight at court, and got in some accident where somebody was hurt, and then he was sentenced to jail. He escaped and shot a policeman, and from that time on, he was chastened by police. And Nobody knows in the movie whether that's true or not, and it's not important. And his idea is that he wants to take revenge on society, and so therefore he's running around the neighborhood, and he's, he's giving candies to children, but there are razor blades built in the candy, so if the kids are eating the candies, they cut themselves and die in their own blood. So he's, he's a victim of society, but on the other hand, it's the real evil guy. And what is quite funny in the rest of the movie is that by taking possession of her body, of the body of the researcher, uh, he walks with her. So she goes back to the university and he goes with her. Then he somehow whoops, gets out of her. And first of all, he kills her lover, the professor. Second, she, he kills the professor of the professor. And at the end, he kills the whole faculty of urban <laughs> research. Because all theory about urban research is the most evil in the world, of course. And, the, and, and the, let's say the moral of this story is somehow weird because uh, the, the researcher was first a typical architect, architect or urbanist who was, in a, who was in this angel's distance like Michel de Sato described, <coughs> that she's, the city's planable, perceivable, controllable. Okay, I don't know, I, I'll just read a book about the city. And then she goes to the city and wants to re take research on the myth of the city, and then she becomes part of the myth herself. And at the end of the film, she doesn't know what to do anymore because she, she, she knows that she, or he in her, is killing one after the other, one after the other. She doesn't really defend herself when he or she is killing professors. It seems to make fun to kill professors. But when he wants to kill children again, then then there is some sort of mother instinct in her that starts to fight against this black evil. And there is some sort of, I don't know, what's this, Halloween party, and at Halloween he's used to kill as many children as possible each year. So she, when, 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 he, when he tries to kill the next children close to a Halloween fire, <coughs> she sacrifices herself and jumps into the fire and burns. And then you can see in the movie, you can see a sort of blurred image, and both the ghosts of him and the ghost of her are somehow weaving to heaven. And as everybody will know, Candyman 2 will come next year on in the cinemas. So that's the end of my story. Thank you very much. <laughs>